In today's video, we're going to learn all about construction specifications and how it relates back to the building process. Let's go! So we all know what a set of construction drawings looks like, but many construction projects also come with a set of specifications. Simply put, the drawings are intended to be your visual aid and the specifications are intended to be your written aid. Construction drawings will still usually have a lot of written context next to the visuals or what we call details, but you'll still notice a lot of written context directly or indirectly pointing you back to the specifications. We'll take a look at a few examples on an actual drawing set at the end of this video. So let me take a step back. Projects can be executed using a variety of typical and atypical contracts. A fairly standard form of contract in commercial construction is the AIA agreement. This form of contract was developed as a means to standardize contract language within the construction industry, written by none other than the American Institute of Architects. The AIA agreement comes in over 200 templates to fit various projects and how these contracts are structured to fit those projects. There are other formats other than the AIA, but the AIA is widely used and recognized. So, so why, why am, am I talking, talking about, about all this? this? Well, because this makes specifications extremely important because they are a detailed instruction on how the awarded contractor is to go about the execution of the scope. So these specifications, they provide scope of work, general conditions, what specific material you're supposed to use, a general outline of executing the scope, requirements and quality, and much, much more. It's critical that you read, digest, and hopefully remember your specifications throughout the course of the project. Unfortunately, not knowing your specifications, whether you're a contractor, general contractor, or construction manager can lead to incorrect material orders, incorrect installations, additional rework, additional costs, and potential delays to your overall construction schedule, which is everything you want to avoid. We got our hands on a spec book, so let's talk about how this thing's organized. So the Construction Specifications Institute, or CSI, actually created their own master format, which is the most widely used standard for organizing specifications for building projects in both the US and Canada. The CSI master format is broken up by division numbers and their corresponding scope descriptions. I'll drop some more information in the video description below with each of these division numbers and names. But remember, not every project is the same, so one project may have certain division numbers that another does not. And also, those specs within those divisions may change just based on the requirements of that project. Let's take a look at this spec book. The first page, as you can see, is a cover page. The cover page will usually tell you the project name, date, address, and the key players involved. Following the cover page, you should typically find the table of contents, which is your navigational aid throughout this document. There will typically be a title at the top of the page to indicate which division you are in, and the division number is usually also at the bottom of the page. Following the division number at the bottom of the page, you'll usually find a dash one, dash two, etc. This is to indicate which page you're on within the specification division to further help you navigate. I'm gonna briefly cover the general requirement items and then I'm gonna jump into a specific specification section. Existing condition information could range from site surveys, which are usually external reference documents showing where past buildings and underground structures may exist, to geotechnical reports, which would tell you the composition of your building soils before you get started. Submittal procedures. So submittals are documents that contractors are responsible to provide or submit on to show the architect or engineer that you're following the specifications. These are not construction contract documents, but rather meant to be a checks and balance approach to help the delivery of the project. This submittal procedures section explains how you're supposed to transmit your submittals to the architect or engineer. Architects and engineers can approve or reject submittals if they are not in alignment with all of the specifications. Substitution procedures. As a contractor, you might not have access to a product due to market volatility or unavailability of some material. This section outlines the procedures for submitting on material outside of the required specifications for approval. Quality requirements. Pretty self-explanatory. It outlines how to complete the scope to a particular standard. Quality requirements can also include testing requirements, references. This section usually outlines industry organizations that set the standards for building construction as it applies to this specific project. Construction waste management and disposal is usually included if you work on a lead or a green project, which outlines how material is supposed to be sorted before it goes to a landfill or recycling station. Closeout procedures are everything you need to do at the end of the project. Operation and maintenance data. So when you turn over a new building, your owner typically doesn't know how to use everything within it. The operation and maintenance data outlines what you need to turn over and how you need to train your owner so that they're ready to use their new building. 
project record documents is everything that you hand over to the owner as part of that final package that they can reference at a later date, including your warranties, substantial completion letters, occupancy permits, and so forth. One section missing from this general requirements list is RFI procedures. RFI stands for a request for information, which is just construction lingo for asking a question. This section might be provided so you can follow exactly what to include in your question, what to exclude, and how to get that message across to your architect or engineer. Submittals and RFIs each require their own breakout video, which I'll release in the future, so stay tuned. The division sections following Division 00 and Division 1 go further in depth into those particular scopes of work. Let's go take a look at one of these. So I've jumped into the rough carpentry section, which is section 06, 10, 00, and we're on page one of this. As you can see, it's broken into different parts. The first part is general. Within that part, there's subsections, subsections from that, and so on and so forth. So section 1.1 section includes is everything that you'll find in this specification section. Section 1.2 is related work or everything that this specification section might relate to elsewhere in the specification book. Section 1.3, we've seen it before, is references. These are codes and standards. Section 1.4 calls out quality assurance and quality requirements. Section 1.5 is your submittals. Again, I'll cover it in a different video, but submittals can be shop drawings, product data, samples, etc. Material vendors also publish their specifications to their products on their website so that architects can reference them if they want to use the material on that project. Let's take a quick look at an example. Here's an example of an online material vendor providing their own specification section for a carpet installation. As you can see, an architect can just take this, copy it, paste it into their spec book and adjust it as needed to meet the requirements of the project. They usually want to stay closer to what the manufacturer recommends just so that they're in alignment with the installation of the product. Section 1.6, this talks about delivery, storage, and handling of the material. So then we get into part two, which is products and materials, which actually goes in depth into which products and specific materials we should be sourcing for this building. And then finally, part three, the execution and how to actually go about installation. And then furthermore, if there is testing or owner training required as part of this section. Not all spec books are created the same, so not all spec sections look the same. So each division and their corresponding subsections will all be laid out similarly to this rough carpentry spec section that we just looked at. I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you have some time on your hands, I'd suggest finding a spec book and reading through it. If you have no construction experience, this will give you a kickstart in your career and help explain the building process. As, As always, always, bye for now. now.